And apart from that, people have enough problems in the world without going and seeing them on the screen. It's better they should escape from the humdrum normal existence into the world of fantasy and relax. That's what entertainment means. The Greek theatre meant to transport the audience to the gods, which meant them meant to let them see heaven, which is another way of saying take oneself out of oneself. In this video, I want to go back to basics. See, the first video I ever made on this channel looked at how to make a good James Bond movie, and since then 007 has been a regular guest star in my videos. But there is a glaring omission in my Bond coverage that I am hoping I can put right. Roger Moore's record 7 film tenure in the role can be the subject of only sometimes justified mockery, and while I have been guilty of criticising some of his more ludicrous moments in the past, I still absolutely love his take on Bond, and it is one I have come to appreciate even more as time goes on. And so as I slowly but surely work my way through the Bond pantheon, and in honour of 007's 60th anniversary this month, I want to talk about Roger Moore and one of, if not the greatest James Bond movie of them all. That's right, this is a video essay about the spy who loved me, and this one is for all of you who have been badgering me to make more Bond content. It's taken a while, but it's finally here, and it is by far the longest video I've ever done because, well, I love this film and I have a lot to say about it. And so if you want to support me making even more Bond videos, then you can do that simply by turning that red button grey. And with that out of the way, let's get into the review. Yes, I'll put our best man on it at once. Never was the phrase, nobody does it better, more aptly applied to a James Bond film. The Spy Who Loved Me is among the most exotic, glamorous, globe-trotting, action-heavy, stunt-laden and entertaining movies in the series. It has it all. Barbara Back, the car that becomes a submarine. Jaws, Barbara Back, the parachute jump. Egypt, Italy, Scotland, Ken Adams sets, Barbara Back, and of course, the one and only Sir Roger Moore at his finest. It's not surprising that if you ask pretty much any Bond fan for their rankings, The Spy Who Loved Me is going to be in the top three. But this is more than just a massively entertaining spy movie. I argue that it is the single most important movie in the entire Bond series. Because it is the movie that saved the series and planted the seeds that would allow it to continue to thrive for another 45 years and counting. So before we do a deep dive into the movie itself, let's put this film in its historical context because to be honest it's a bit of a miracle this movie even got made in the first place. See, it's hard to believe now, but when The Spy Who Loved Me came out in 1977, the James Bond series was in a bad way. Since Sean Connery left the role, then came back, then left again, the future of James Bond on the big screen was in considerable doubt and had been for several years. Eon Productions were in many ways a victim of their own success. No one had ever expected Bond to be as big as it was, I mean Doctor No only cost a million dollars to make, but through these films they had inadvertently created a cultural and cinematic icon one that was firmly linked to Sean Connery himself. So when Connery made it clear he was leaving the role for good, Eon faced two questions. Do we hang up our hats and retire the series altogether, or do we try again to replace Sean Connery? After all, their first attempt to replace him had not really worked. Although it is highly regarded now, On Her Majesty's Secret Service was a bit of a flop, at least by Bond standards. George Lazenby's performance as the character wasn't well received by audiences at the time, and there was no guarantee that they would warm to another fella. And at first they didn't. Roger Moore's first two outings as James Bond again were met with middling reviews and in the case of The Man with the Golden Gun, a very underwhelming box office return. They were far from the Bond mania glory days of Goldfinger and Thunderball and it seemed that after a decade, audiences were losing interest in Bond, especially now that its iconic leading man had left. And so as Eon geared up to make the 10th Bond movie, it was a do or die moment. If this movie didn't succeed, that would be the end of James Bond on film. The pressure was on for The Spy Who Loved Me to deliver, and deliver big. Not only did it have to rekindle audiences' enthusiasm for Bond in general, more importantly it had to cement Roger Moore as the definitive James Bond. This is familiar to us now of course, every 10 years or so the Bond series has to quote unquote reinvent itself to stay modern and relevant. But there's a first time for everything, and this was the first time Eon actually had to do this. Because even though Roger Moore had already had two outings as James Bond at this point, he was still very hampered by the legacy of Sean Connery. The entire Bond series was still stuck trying to follow the formula that had made Connery's films so popular. Breaking away from this formula ended up being the key to the success of The Spy Who Loved Me, but as we'll see later, that was easier said than done. So before we get into how it did it, we still haven't finished with all the reasons James Bond was in trouble in the 1970s, because the problems went far beyond the fallout of Sean Connery's departure. Harry Saltzman, one of the two producers who made the Bond series what it was, fell into debt and had to sell his share of the rights. 
the company did go into a sort of liquidation, a hiatus, um, it could not actually produce the James Bond film. And after much, much ado, we won. Harry unfortunately lost his shares and therefore was out of the company. But E.ON had simply traded one problem for another because now they needed a director. Originally, Bond staple Guy Hamilton was all lined up to direct, but he left the project to work on Superman. Spoiler alert, he was eventually replaced on that too. But this still left The Spy Who Loved Me without a director. Funnily enough, E.ON actually turned down an offer from Steven Spielberg to direct, but if you want to know what a Spielberg Bond movie would look like, then watch Raiders of the Lost Ark. See, for E.ON, this was too big of a project to risk on an unknown director, so they wanted someone with Bond experience to lead it. With Guy Hamilton off the project, that left them with very few other choices. The obvious backup would have been Peter Hunt, the OHMSS director who had also worked with Roger Moore on the Persuaders TV show. But Hunt declined the offer, preferring to work on other things. So surely the next logical choice would be Terence Young, the man who directed Bond's first two adventures as well as Thunderball, which if you adjust for inflation is still the second highest grossing James Bond film of all time. Surely he would be the natural choice to reinvent Bond. Well, it's unclear whether or not he was ever formally offered the job, but if he was, he declined. And so the job fell to Lewis Gilbert, the director of You Only Live Twice. We'll come back to Gilbert shortly, but the decision to bring him in and not Terence Young or Guy Hamilton was, I think, one of the most important reasons The Spy Who Loved Me was the success it was, and part of the reason it saved the Bond series. So with the director sorted, the last thing we need is to write the movie. Not to worry, it's 1975 and we still have several Eon Fleming James Bond novels to draw on. Except it turns out that we don't. See, Eon only had the permission to use the title of the Fleming novel, The Spy Who Loved Me, not the story itself. To be fair, the story itself is not actually told from Bond's perspective and barely even features him, so it would have made a pretty shocking movie, but the fact remained that this would be the first time Eon had to write an entirely original James Bond story for the big screen. Their plan was to go back to basics, a classic Bond story that pitted him off against Spectre and his arch nemesis Blofeld. But of course, there was another problem, a man called Kevin. The saga of Kevin McClory in the James Bond films is the subject of a whole other video which I probably will make one day, but for our purposes what you need to know is that he had a legal claim to the character of Blofeld and the Spectre organisation. So when he heard that Eon were using them in The Spy Who Loved Me, he sued them, resulting in a page one rewrite of the entire script. So with all of this behind the scenes drama going on, it's not hard to see why there was a three year gap between The Man With The Golden Gun and The Spy Who Loved Me. Now I know Bond fans today would give up a Fabergé egg to wait only three years between movies, but up until this point there had been a new Bond film more or less every 18 months or so for 10 years. Having a gap allowed memories of Connery to fade away so that when the new James Bond movie came out it was a new, fresh experience rather than feeling like a rushed rebranding of the same old series. Anyway, against all the odds, the key people were finally in place and producer Cubby Broccoli decided he was going to go big or go home. Rather than trying to cut back and minimise the financial risk, he went the opposite way and threw everything at the spy who loved me giving it a budget almost twice the size of the previous Bond film. He even funded the construction of what is still one of the largest sound stages in the world so that Ken Adam would have a place big enough to house his colossal sets. Cubby knew that the future of Bond lay in this movie and he was sparing no expense to make it the best movie it could possibly be. You can see this right from the start where after the gun barrel we open with a British submarine in crisis and soon learn that both it and a Soviet sub have gone missing. But rather than cutting to Bond, we instead meet the Bond girl first with the very Fleming-esque name of Agent Triple X, real name Anya Amasova. It's actually a great fake out here because we're deliberately led to believe that this is Bond, or at least Bond's Russian alter ego. He's even played by one-time Bond contender Michael Billington, but when he gets up, it is instead revealed that Triple X is in fact Russia's best secret agent. This is Triple X. Message received and understood. We'll come back to her later in the video because we then cut to M and Moneypenny, who are there to introduce Bond in a way that would come to define the humour of the Moore films. He's on a mission, sir, in Austria. Well, tell him to pull out. These sorts of double entendres would end up becoming a recurring feature of Moore's pre-title sequences, but for The Spy Who Loved Me especially, this is the first glimpse we get of how this film was distinguishing itself from the Connery era by leaning into Roger Moore's talent for this kind of winking at the camera humour. Where are you going? Sorry darling, something came up. I mean you'd never get a joke like that in a Connery film, but that's okay because Connery's Bond had a different sense of humour. I discussed this with Cubby before I went on the film, and I said to him one of the mistakes that they're making with the Roger films was that they were trying to turn him into 
uh, Sean Connery. Well, thank God they took that to heart, because right from the start we are seeing more in his element. But we'll talk more about that later too. Let's get on with the pre-title sequence. Bond gets told to pull out through one of the most underrated little gadgets of the series and donning his bright yellow jumpsuit, the 70s really were a different time, he heads off and we get a proper ski chase. Now this isn't filmed anywhere near as well as the one in OHMSS is, but it doesn't matter because after killing the fake Russian Bond we met earlier, he launches himself off the cliff and we get what is still the most iconic and impressive stunt Bond has ever given us, as in one single silent take we watch stuntman Rick Sylvester plummet off a 2000 meter high mountain, and then to the triumphant fanfare of the Bond theme, he opens his Union Jack parachute and glides off into the title sequence. Legend has it that this was met with cheers and a standing ovation at the London premiere, and it's not hard to see why. The 70s weren't a great time for the UK politically or economically, but here was a movie that made British audiences feel patriotic. All over the world, whenever I saw the movie, instead of people howling and throwing stones at the Union Jack, they were bursting into a spontaneous applause, which was kind of satisfactory. Patriotism and Bond have long gone hand in hand, but until Skyfall came along, The Spy Who Loved Me was by far the most British of the Bonds. James, I need you. So does England. But patriotism to one side, the parachute stunt was exactly the sort of shot in the arm the Bond series needed. The films had always been known for their impressive stunts, of course, but this one stood head and shoulders above the ones that had come before it, and was unlike anything seen on the big screen before. Just eight minutes into the film, audiences already knew this was going to be something very different. Then we have a classic Maurice Binder title sequence, which is noteworthy for being the first one to feature a Bond actor in it. And besides reminding us that future Bond director John Glenn edited the movie, I think this sequence really helps set up the film as a romance between Bond and Anya. Because for all the spy intrigue and action, the heart of the spy who loved me is, as the name suggests, the relationship between these two. Like from Russia with Love, OHMSS, Casino Royale, and even The World Is Not Enough, making the relationship between Bond and the Bond girl the core of the film's story and heart almost always makes for a strong and compelling Bond film because it allows the characters to shine. Unfortunately, the shine of the lead characters is a bit let down by the villain. Karl Stromberg, played by Kurt Jurgens, is perfectly fine as a Bond villain, but he is not very memorable, compelling, or even threatening. He's very much just going through the motions. You never really feel like he could be a threat to Bond in the way someone like Goldfinger, Kananga, or Scaramanga could be. But that's okay because he's not really the villain of this movie. That title of course goes to Jaws, who we meet in this scene. Easily the most recognisable and popular Bond henchman, except maybe Oddjob, it's incredible that a character with literally no dialogue could go on to become such an iconic part of the series. It's hard to believe he only appears in two Bond films, I mean growing up I felt like he was in all of them. But regardless, Richard Keel brings this brilliant menace to the role simply through the strength of his physical performance and of course those metal teeth. I think the filmmakers knew he would be popular because they intentionally keep him alive even though any other henchman would die after this, or this, or this, or this. But Jaws just brushes it off, literally, and walks away every time. So yes, the main villain of the film could have been better, but it is more than compensated for by the formidable presence of Jaws. Moving on and we see Anya get her mission from General Gogol and learn that her lover had been killed in action. It appears you become involved in a British secret service operation. I should very much like to meet whoever was responsible for his death. This sets up the dramatic stakes for her and Bond because at this point she does not know it was Bond who killed him, even though we the audience do. Back to 007 and we get our first look at Moore's Bond in his proper naval uniform, something we haven't seen since Gilbert's last Bond film. This scene is also distinctive because they filmed it on location at a British submarine base in Scotland. Visually and thematically it's just so much more interesting than the classic office briefing scenes of the Connery era and it also closely ties to the patriotic themes of the film as well as the plot of a missing submarine. Also if the producers are taking notes, can we please see Bond in uniform again in the next film? It's an aspect of his character that was very much glossed over in the Craig films. Anyway, like Anya before him, Bond is sent off to Cairo under orders to retrieve a microfilm and in a sign that this film is very much a product of its time, we have Bond inexplicably dressed like Peter O'Toole because apparently this was the uniform for white people riding camels in the 1970s. Like even the script itself describes Bond as being dressed in full Lawrence of Arabia garb, so they weren't exactly being subtle with their references. Still, I'll take it over this any day. Bond makes contact with his old friend Sheikh Hussein, who only has a couple of lines, but I just love how Edward D'Souza chooses to play this character in such a bored and uninterested manner. Oh, what a pity it is you persist in being so businesslike. 
he really makes an impression and stands out as one of Bond's more memorable local allies. And of course, a scene in a Roger Moore James Bond film that starts like this can't end without another classic Rogerism. When one is in Egypt, one should delve deeply into its treasures. Oh, how the times have changed. Bond gets to Cairo proper and I just really love all of these scenes. For the first time since You Only Live Twice, this film really feels like a proper globe-trotting adventure and I put a lot of that down to Gilbert's direction. Even though every Bond film takes us to new and exciting places, for me, Moore's last two outings didn't really capture the travelogue element of Bond in an especially memorable way. Except for Scaramanga's Island, the locations in those films were just the backdrop. Here, they're the star. Travel was such an important part of the Fleming novels and the early Bond films and The Spy Who Loved Me really recaptured that magic. In Austria, Scotland, Egypt and Sardinia, Gilbert takes the time to really show off the fact that they are filming on location in parts of the world that would not have been very familiar to Western audiences in the 1970s, which is also exactly what he did when he took us to Japan and You Only Live Twice. Back in Cairo and Bond's fight with Sandor is a bit underwhelming unfortunately. For all his strengths as an actor, Roger Moore just can't sell a fist fight in the same way Connery could and I don't think it was choreographed well enough to hide that but that's not important because we end the scene with our first glimpse at the more ruthless streak that runs through Moore's Bond. Where's Peckish? Where's Peckish? Pyramids! This wouldn't be the last time Moore would kill someone like this, but it was the first and not only did it become an iconic enough Bond moment to be referenced in Quantum of Solace, it was also a reminder that Bond is a killer. Yes, even Roger Moore's Bond. What a helpful chap. He moves on to the pyramids where, fun fact, two-time Bond alumnus Charles Gray is narrating the light show. No traveller, emperor, merchant or poet has trodden on these sands and not gasped in awe. This scene marks Bond's first confrontation with Jaws, who has just killed Fekish, the lead that both Bond and Anya were after. The two spies meet for the first time, briefly, but the real introduction comes in the next scene. I love everything about this, from the setting to the costumes. Roger Moore looks so comfortable in the role of Bond here in his trademark tuxedo, and this dress is a truly stunning piece of cinema history that was a clear inspiration for Palomas in No Time to Die. But at a deeper level, this scene firmly establishes a mutual respect between Bond and Anya as they both both show off how much they know about each other, to the extent that Anya even orders Bond's signature drink for him. For the gentleman, vodka martini, shaken, not stirred. Like the train scene in Casino Royale, there's not really any plot purpose to the scene with our two leads. It's all about character and it includes this standout moment for more. Married only once. Wife killed. All right, you've made your point. You're sensitive, Mr. Bond. About certain things, yes. Moore just conveys the harder edge of Bond so well in this moment, and he shows us a side of the character that we have never really seen before except for the moment where this actually happened. Unlike Diamonds Are Forever or the past two Moore films, here the film is showing us that Bond is still carrying Tracy's death with him, and we see some emotional vulnerability in him. In Connery we saw anger and fear, but only rarely did we see grief, and if we did, he would never reveal this side of his character to someone like Anya. I don't say this to criticise Connery's portrayal of Bond, I'm not doing that at all. No, I'm using the comparison to show how The Spy Who Loved Me was specifically written for Roger Moore's Bond. His previous two films were clearly still influenced by the fact that the writers were still imagining Connery in the role. Take for instance this infamous scene in Golden Gun. This is something you would see Connery do but it's jarring for Moore. The Spy Who Loved Me included scenes like this one because it was playing to Roger Moore's strengths as an actor and allowing his own interpretation of the Bond character to shine through. Instead of trying to copy Connery, he was taking the character somewhere new. This would be something that each subsequent Bond actor would do of course and it is why the series has had such longevity. Moore was the pioneer of that approach and this scene encapsulates that brilliantly. Anyway, after Jaws kills the club owner that Bond and Anya were after, they sneak into his van in pursuit. We've really got to stop meeting like this. As they journey through the desert we get some more quiet moments between Bond and Anya before they arrive at the temple. And this scene where they pursue Jaws is just so great. The blocking and the framing is all designed to take full advantage of the scale of the location and the silence really builds the tension of this cat and mouse hunt. It's just absolutely stunning. The scene ends with another switcheroo to establish Anya as Bond's ruthless equal as she takes the microfilm and leaves Bond to face Jaws. Through some ingenuity he escapes and we get yet another excellent scene that plays to Moore's strengths at balancing comedy with tension as he calmly pays Anya back for abandoning him by putting her in charge of evading Jaws and just sitting back with a smirk on his face as he slowly destroys the car. Try the big one. Can you play any other tune? 
Let's try reverse. That's backwards. Women drivers. Quiet. Watch this. Let's try reverse. Let's try reverse. Shaken, but not stirred. It's a bit of a tonal shift, but I think Moore pulls it off as they drive away and escape from Jaws. And as if the early reference wasn't enough, for some reason they use the score of Lawrence of Arabia for this scene, which, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think is the only time a Bond film uses a score from another movie. Anyway, our heroes get on a boat to Cairo where we again deepen the connection between the two of them. The mutual respect between them grows and, bathed in the sunset light, the inevitable romance begins, as well as the inevitable double crossing. I think we should call it your grave. Ah, curse your sudden but inevitable betrayal! Now, I have to acknowledge here that while of course she looks the part of a Bond girl, Barbara Back is not the best actor in the world, and in fact I think most of the time her performance is quite wooden. This is Triple X. Message received and understood. The accent doesn't help, of course, but she's lucky the character is so well written. I think in the hands of a more talented actress like Diana Rigg or Eva Green, Anya could be among the best ever Bond girls. It's a shame because scenes like this really end up being carried by Moore and I think this film could have been even better if the role had been cast differently. So we go into the MI6 base that's hidden in the temple of Abbey Simbel, continuing what would become a more era trope of MI6 just randomly having all these hidden but themed bases around the world. It's great, I love it so much. Between Bond, Anya and Q, they work out that Stromberg is the one behind the submarines going missing and they're tasked to work together to get to the bottom of it. The pair jet off to Sardinia in Italy to investigate, but not before having another fight with Jaws and a clear homage to From Russia With Love. What happened? He just dropped in for a quick fight. Bond's first meeting with Stromberg, like the villain himself, is pretty unremarkable. It mostly serves to just move the plot along and to show off some more of Ken Adams' set design. More on that later. But the centerpiece of the Sardinia scenes is of course the car chase with the Lotus Esprit. I know the DB5 gets all the love and this will probably land me in some sort of Bond fan prison, but this is my favourite Bond car. Yeah, okay, okay, this is actually my favourite Bond car, but the Esprit is a close second. It's just so distinctive, not just from the DB5, but from any other Bond car before or since. The story goes that Lotus knew Eon were looking for a car to replace the Aston Martin and so just parked the Esprit outside of Pinewood Studios so that Cubby Broccoli would see it. Hey, it's not stupid if it works. And Q's introduction of the car is just Desmond Llewellyn at his best. I love how he came all the way out to personally deliver the car to Bond and explain all of its bells and whistles, only for Bond to just speed away and leave him on a dock somewhere in Italy by himself. Q, have I ever let you down? Frequently. Oh Desmond, you're sorely missed. Oh, by the way, this scene is also noteworthy because we even get a little nod to Q's real name. Good morning, Major Boothroyd. Morning, Major. But of course, we are here because the car has a starring role in one of the most famous Bond chases of all time. This whole sequence really shows off the big budget of this film, and Jaws has once again returned, but of course the piece de resistance is the submarine. And need I say more, what's not to love about this? It's just so cool, a car that turns into a submarine, the practical model still holds up, and the sequence even ends with Moore giving a characteristic wink to the audience. The filmmakers know that this is silly, and they're just telling us to go with it and enjoy it, and that's something I just love about the Moore films. Things are looking good for our heroes until Anya learns that Bond is the one who killed her lover. The answer to the question is yes. I did kill him. Then this mission is over. I will kill you. This exchange is a brilliant character moment that flips the dynamic between the two of them and once again allows more to shine. In our business, Anya, people get killed. We both know that. So did he. I just love how cold and professional he becomes when forced to face the reality of his work and it's such a contrast to his usual nature that it really gives these moments the weight they deserve. Moore's strength as an actor is that he can go from a scene like this to one like this and not have it feel jarring or inconsistent with his character. After this, and Bond and Anya move on to the third act of the film and they team up with an American subcrew to investigate Stromberg's base. But they are captured and discover that Stromberg's giant tanker was responsible for scooping up the missing British and Soviet submarines along with their nuclear missiles. And here we get the Ken Adams set in all its glory and like all of his work it looks amazing. It was so huge that Stanley Kubrick himself was roped in to give the cinematographer advice on how best to light it with all of its dark colours and reflective surfaces. I wanted to get another opinion in on how to use my practicals and whether to improve them and so on. 
For me, as a Bond villain layer, this is second only to Blofeld's volcano in You Only Live Twice, another Adam design, and this whole third act underscores once again why Gilbert was the best choice of director for this movie. The similarities are clear with the opposing armies having an explosive shootout in a way that makes full use of the huge scale of the set while keeping the focus squarely on Bond. Because this is what happens after Stromberg reveals his grand plan to start a nuclear war and create a new and beautiful world beneath the sea. It's classic Bond villain stuff. He takes Anya hostage and jets off back to his lair in what is definitely not a little toy speedboat model, while Bond escapes and, after freeing the captured sailors, manages to stop the nukes and save the world. But of course, Anya is now stuck on the base with Stromberg, the base that the Americans have been ordered to destroy. So with the clock ticking, Bond assembles his emergency jet ski, which for some reason he just has in his luggage, and heads off to rescue her. He confronts and kills Stromberg, and once again it's a fairly unremarkable exchange befitting a fairly unremarkable villain. But that's okay because the real showdown is with Jaws, the true villain of the movie. Taking full advantage of the set to stage his fight, it ends in a use their strength against the moment as Bond grabs Jaws by the, well, Jaws, with an electromagnet, and drops him into the shark pool. Again, this is a movie that knows how ridiculous it is. And just in case you are in any doubt, Jaws kills the shark by eating it. If only Felix had thought of that and License to Kill. Anyway, Bond rescues Anya who for plot purposes and no other reason at all has been given a costume change, but it's too late. The base is being destroyed. The water rushing in and the explosions add tension and urgency to these final moments, but of course they get away. And because this is a James Bond film, they get away in a luxurious escape pod complete with a bed and fine champagne. But it's not over yet. For one thing, we need to clarify that Jaws of course escaped into the next movie, but back in the escape pod, Anya holds Bond at gunpoint. After all, she did vow to kill him after the mission. But naturally, Bond's charm has won her over and she instead pops the champagne cork and, well, let's get out of these wet things. So the escape craft is picked up by the Royal Navy where M, Gogol and Q are waiting to set the stage for another staple of the Roger Moore Bond films. Finishing on a double entendre that, no matter how cringe inducing it may be, guarantees that you finish the film with an eye roll, yes, but also a big stupid grin on your face. Son, what do you think you're doing? Keeping the British hand up, sir. Needless to say, The Spy Who Loved Me was a massive success, though its total box office take wasn't helped by the fact that it came out just a week before a small independent movie called Star Wars. By the way, that's why the next Bond movie was Moonraker and not For Your Eyes Only, as the credits promised. This movie completely revitalised the Bond series and set the tone for the next four movies led by Roger Moore and beyond. It proved once and for all that rather than trying to recapture the magic of an age that has passed, Bond needs to change and evolve along with his audience. Goldfinger might have been the film that firmly established the Bond movie formula, but The Spy Who Loved Me was the film that perfected it. Against all the odds, this is the film that saved the Bond franchise, made Roger Moore the definitive James Bond for a whole generation of filmgoers, and did all of this while being a thrilling and insanely entertaining Bond movie that, 45 years later, is still considered one of the greatest of all time. So to take a leaf out of Roger Moore's book, allow me to finally end this very long video essay on a cheesy one-liner. Because when it comes to James Bond movies, nobody does it better than the spy who loved me. Hope you enjoyed the show. Good night. <laughs>